Good morning, Cross Park. Welcome to our digital service for this week. I'm so glad you could join us. I want to tell you about something unique happening next week. Next Sunday, April 25th, we are officially celebrating our 10-year anniversary. Officially, our 10-year anniversary was in March, but we're going to celebrate it together next Sunday, weather permitting. But because it's going to be a unique service, we are not going to be able to offer the same kind of digital service next week that we normally do. Our goal is to set up a live stream option, but since we have not done that from the parking lot uh, for a whole service yet, we're not for sure if that's gonna work. So watch your email next week and we'll try to let you know exactly what that's gonna look like. If you have not been with us in a while because of the pandemic, and if you are comfortable doing so, we'd love to invite you to come join us next Sunday morning in the parking lot. We're gonna have, uh, like I said, a special service and we're gonna follow it with a meal afterwards. You can bring your own food, but we are gonna have food trucks available to buy food from. We'll also have some drinks and desserts so that together we can celebrate God's goodness and faithfulness to us at Cross Park for the last 10 years. Well, we are now gonna head into our time of worship, so I want you to hear this call to worship from Psalm 98. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you have worked salvation. You have revealed to us through Jesus what you are about, who you are, what you are doing. That you are working through the church to bring about your purposes, and that as those purposes ripen and come to fulfillment, you will even bring about a new heavens and a new earth. We are thrilled to be a part of what you are doing. Father, it's so easy for us to forget that, to not think about it, to miss it entirely. So we pray that as we sing this old song, this Psalm 98 song, as our call to worship, that it will remind us that you are always up to new things. You are always advancing your kingdom. And we pray today that we would give you the worship that you are due and that you would continue to call us into um, a kingdom life, a kingdom mindset where we live life with you, for you, and toward you. Father, we thank you for all of this and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
father's throne above so free so infinite his grace indeed himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race his mercy This morning, our confession of faith is an old one that the church has been using for thousands of years, the Apostles' Creed from the early centuries of the church. I'll ask the question and we will answer together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, in the life everlasting. Amen. All things belong to God. He has graciously shared good things with us, and so we lovingly give back to Him out of what He's given to us as our act of worship. You're welcome to pause the video now and look, if you're on a computer, to the right of the video on the worship page or on a phone or tablet. You can look below the video and you'll see several links that you can use now or later to give. But we encourage you to give as part of your spiritual act of worship. Cross Park is my privilege to lead us in prayer. Let's go to the Lord together. Father, I come to you this morning sensing my weakness, knowing our limitations. We confess so many weaknesses. Some of them are simply that we are weak and frail and human and not able to do all that we'd like to do. 
Some of them are specifically tied to our sin, whether it's in our attitude, in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, our tendency towards sin, but also sins that we live out against others, against you, even against ourselves in some ways. And so we want to start by confessing that sin, uh, that the sin is a problem, that it separates and alienates us from you, and that we need your mercy on it. So we now confess our sin. Father, I pray that you will give mercy and forgiveness. We are blown away by the fact that you love to do that, that you are a gracious and kind God, and that you deal with us much better than we deserve. You do not give us what we deserve in our sin, but you offer us mercy and freedom and forgiveness. Uh, We thank you that you offer that to your people in Jesus, that we can know We can be confident in Jesus that our sins are forgiven and that even as we struggle with sin still, that we can quickly turn from it and come to you and find uh, help and hope so that we don't have to stay stuck in that sin. Father, we also pray beyond our own sin and the freedom that you give us there, we have to confess that one of our struggles is that we don't want to be weak. We don't want to be humble. We don't want to be limited. We wish we could do more, sometimes for the right reasons, often for the wrong reasons. We want to glorify ourselves. We want to prove something. We want to show what we are, how great we can be. And yet, we're so limited. Our ability to do any of those things is really, really, really so much less than we imagine, so much less than we hope. And we see that as a bad thing, Father, but you see it as a good thing. You teach us to be your people, to be soft and humble, to be weak and low even. Father, we don't want that. We don't want the various kinds of struggle and lowliness that we experience. And so I ask today that you would help us, whatever kind of lowliness and weakness we're all experiencing or struggling with, that you would help us both properly accept from you circumstances we can't change, that we'd also lean into lamenting some of our weaknesses, uh, the struggles in the world that we all experience, but also pray that you would help us to have the right perspective to know that our weakness is not always bad, that sometimes it's very, very good, it's necessary to be weak, that it actually helps us to see the gospel and our need for you. Also that in one sense, our weakness is really temporary. It's just during this life, and as long and significant as that sounds, if it's true that you are an eternal God and you love us, then we have eternity of a perfect relationship with you, no weakness, no sin, no suffering, no tears, no sickness, no death. And we are so thankful for that. So we pray that truly the, the struggle and suffering we experience now, as Paul says, will generate for us a weight of glory that down the road will be our the this glory that you give us will be so good that it will easily and quickly and always outweigh anything negative that we have experienced now and then in fact the things that are negative and bad and suffering and weakness now will be part of what creates the delight in the future father we don't fully understand that but we know that it's true and it's good and so we claim that Father, we pray that you would teach us as individuals and as a church to properly engage our limits and um, properly lean into our weakness and to know what you are up to, to know how, especially in our weakness and humility, we can love people around us, uh, move towards people who need to be loved, people who don't know you, people who do know you but are feeling far from you those who need to be encouraged, who also are suffering and struggling. Father, we pray that you'd help us to do those things, that you'd give us wisdom, motivation, that you'd help us see what your plans are for us, and that particularly even in our weakness, you have good things for us to do. Father, we thank you for all this. We pray now that you would get our hearts ready for your word, for hearing your word preached, and that you would use it to penetrate deeply within us and to show us and teach us exactly what we need to know. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.
You know, there are several ways to think about the biblical idea that what is true and what we do are closely connected. Now, we cover this frequently because it's all over the place in the Bible. The biblical authors very clearly want you to see that what we do is based on and grounded in what is true. However, it is a common area of confusion, and our confusion goes something like this. If I'm saved by grace, truly, it's not my work, it's nothing I did, my status before God is so secure because of Jesus' work for me that it doesn't fluctuate and change based on whatever I'm doing at the moment, then exactly why is it that we should do good things? Why should we worry about what the right thing to do is, uh, moral behavior, ethics, etc. If I'm totally saved by grace, why does it matter? And there's a number of answers to this. The New Testament answers it in some different ways, complementary ways. But my answer today is that whatever you want to call it, behavior, day-to-day -day life, ethical, moral obligations, those are the specific things, the specific ways that give shape to God's desire for us to actually experience the life of the Spirit and the life of His resurrection. As Eugene Peterson says it, our moral acts are forms, in the sense that a pottery vase gives form to a bouquet of flowers, or in the sense that a bucket provides a form for getting water from the well to the kitchen, or in the sense that a bugle gives form to a compressed column of air so that taps can be played. Moral acts are art forms for arranging and giving expression to resurrection. Another way to say this, then, is there's no hypothetical obedience or delight in God. There's only the actual experience of those things, which must take the shape of the specific moral teaching of the Bible, the commands that God gives us all over the place. So, as we read today's passage, I want you to listen to how Paul answers this question, how Paul helps us think about what is true and what we do, as he talks about two ways of living, the formal, former, futile way of living, and a fresh, fertile way of living. Listen to our text. It is Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. 
But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Let's pray together. Father, we do pray that this word will go deep into our inner man, that you will do your work that only you can do. So we pray right now that you would uh, open the eyes of our heart, that you would make us receptive to what you have for us. We ask it in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Just a castaway, an island lost at sea, another lonely day with no one here but me, more loneliness than any man could bear. Rescue me before I fall into despair. We are alienated people. We're alienated from God. We're alienated from one another so often, and we're even alienated from our true selves. We don't always understand who we are, and that sense of alienation is well captured here in the lyrics I just read. I left out some of the OOs in the lyrics, but this is an old song by The Police, sung by Sting, and it's called Message in a Bottle. And it speaks to the sense of alienation, that I, I, I'm alienated from the things that matter the most. And Paul here in this text is talking about alienation and how alienation belongs to this former feudal way of life, which is going to be our first point, verses 17 through 19, but that Jesus has brought a fresh, new, fertile way of life in verses 20 through 24. So let's look at those two sections, starting with verse 17. We have now in our text, another good translation is therefore. It's actually the very same word in Greek as the therefore in 4 verse 1 because it's serving to reach back and to connect you to all that Paul has said throughout the book so far. He's connecting everything he has to say with these foundational truths that he's already given us. Now, as we are here in chapter 4, there's a transition happening. Finally, Paul is moving from what is true to what you do. The shift isn't away from these key truths of God's activity. Rather, it's a focus on working out the implications and applications of what God has done for the Christian life. So Jordan's passage last week, verses 1 through 16, marked the beginning of this transition from the church as something God has created to now the church is something we participate in. And here, finally in verse 17, that transition is complete. He has given us this story about who God is and what God has done, and now the story shifts to how we live it out. And notice he says now that he will testify is one of the key verbs here. This word means to insist or to urge. It's a serious term. It's trying to get their attention, to alert them to the importance of what follows. And it's a concern that if you ignore or don't listen to what I'm about to say, it could be dangerous for you. So this is a rhetorical device to show them that they really need to listen so that he can charge them solemnly to turn away from their former ways. To further highlight the importance of what he has to say, he adds the phrase, in the Lord which he's saying, remember, this is not just some ideas. This has the weight of Jesus' authority behind it. And what is the command? What does he tell them to do? He says, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles do, which may sound a little odd because he's speaking to Gentiles after all. But Paul has two distinct ways he uses the word Gentiles. First, it's simply an ethnic marker. There were Jews, people who were ethnically Jewish and did all the Jewish things in the Jewish religion. And then there was everyone else, Gentiles, people, they weren't Jews, they weren't circumcised, they didn't keep Sabbath, etc. So that's often how he uses the word. However, there's another way he uses the word that Gentiles can be a way that characterizes the life of the people who are usually in that category, meaning they have rival religious views and rival worship. They have a behavior that is distinctly non-Christian. So his church is Jews and Gentiles together. But by the second century, 
uh, Christians began to identify themselves as a third category because the life of Jesus so defined them that they understood that was their key identity marker. So in one sense, Paul's saying, even though you were Gentiles, you can't keep living like the Gentiles. Now, he describes what Gentile life is like and why Christians should avoid such living. Now, I want you to notice his commentary here is not so much about a list of sins, but about a fundamental inner problem, a disorientation. They're oriented away from God and simply living for themselves. And that way is futile. It's accomplishing nothing good spiritually, and they should leave it behind. So here in 17 through 19, Paul spells out, four different tightly related problems with that former, former way of life. First, they're in their futility of mind. Uh, the word here means idle, empty, meaningless. It's connected to the idea of vanity. Vanity, all is vanity from Ecclesiastes. Or it's also connected to multiple places in the Old Testament where the Bible says if you worship an idol whether that's an actual physical carved idol, which was common in their culture, or for us, much more likely, is that we may worship a non-God thing or concept, but we invest it with God-like meaning and status and hope to get God-like results from it. When you worship an idol, you are literally giving yourself to something empty, and therefore you become empty-minded as well, because we become like what we worship. So first, we have this futile, empty mindset, if we're not Christians. Secondly, he says, we are darkened in our understanding. See, there's no real understanding or knowledge unless you fear God, the Bible tells us, unless you actually know the one true God. So there's no light to show them what's true, and so their futility and darkness does not allow them to think their way out of the shadows. Third, he says they are alienated from God, in part because of this ignorance, darkness, and futility of mind. But beyond that even, and behind all that, because of their hardness of heart. Now, the word heart in the Bible doesn't just mean feelings or emotions as we often use it. It's more like a control center for the person or the seat of your deepest loyalties, your deepest inner reality which shows whether you really live with and for God or whether you live for yourself. Now, when we talk about how the Bible describes what we are as people, we have to say that the Bible uses a variety of images and metaphors, and we don't want to overread these. Um, the Bible speaks about, oftentimes, our experience, the phenomenon of what it feels like to be a person, and so sometimes it divides us up into different categories or parts, but I don't think we should read that mechanistically as if we actually are three things, body, soul, and spirit. Well, what about another verse that says that we're heart, soul, mind, and strength? I think both of these are ways to say all of you, the whole thing, and that we can use different language in different ways to express our experience. However, taken as a whole, it's probably best to say that the Bible understands humans as two things. There's an inner man and an outer man, an inner reality and an outer reality. And that inner reality can be discussed in various ways, and that outer reality more or less is identified with our physical body. Paul here then is focused on that inner man. And the final verse, verse 19 in this section, shows how the inner man drives what happens in our outer experience. Because the fourth problem he mentions is that we become callous. Now, I spent the summer between high school and college, I spent 30 days with the National Outdoor Leadership School, kind of like Outward Bound, if you know what that is, hiking in the Rockies of Wyoming. We were really out in the middle of nowhere, um, 30 days out by ourselves. And at the end of that time, walking for miles and miles a day in heavy boots over rough terrain, streams, big rocks, etc., etc., the bottoms of my feet were like leather. Truly, they were extremely thick. And as a 17-year-old, I thought that was so cool. They were so thick and hard that I would take a pocket knife and cut my heel to prove how thick the skin had become. Now, not all 17-year-olds would do that. 
uh, but I was a special kind of 17 year old. So I did, I cut my heel with my pocket knife and I did not bleed, it didn't hurt very much, and there was a line in my heel for weeks and weeks. Why? Because the skin truly had become toughened, calloused, insensitive, hardened. See, our hard, callous hearts don't feel proper affection for God and his ways. And because of that, we give ourselves over to all kinds of other feelings and practices and sinful lusts. It's sort of ironic. The low desire for God results in an over desire, a greed, a lust for all sorts of things that take you away from God. So in summary here, he says, there's a fundamental inner disorientation that we can't fix. We love the wrong things. That leads to futility and meaningless and negative consequences of our actions that keep us stuck in that futility. So Paul is addressing this because you have to be vigilant in fighting against this tendency in you. It's true that as a Christian, absolutely, you have a new life and you should grow and change and become more like Jesus practically. However, that doesn't mean that it simply happens overnight or simply happens because you want it to. You have to attend to it and engage it. We're always fighting mixed motives. We live in what Paul himself calls this body of sin or a body of death. And we live in a broken world. So with all of that as our setting... It's just true that our vision or motivation for obedience often leaks and it must be renewed and replenished. It's normal to slide into this old way of living, just like it's normal for a deer to freeze when headlights shine on it. It's normal, it's natural, and it's deadly. So Paul is saying, you don't want to end up here. You've got to fight by faith to move away from this futile way of living and move into a fresh and fertile way of living with Jesus, which is the second half of our passage, starting in verse 20.2. He says, he starts by saying, this is not the way you learned Christ. Now, in English and in Greek, it's odd language. You don't typically say you learned a person. You typically say you learned about the person or heard from them or believed things about them. It's not that those things are untrue. It's not that you don't have to believe doctrine or accept truth about Jesus. It's simply that it's more than that. What he's doing here, which shouldn't be too surprising to us, is that he's speaking in relational terms. It's not that you heard about Christ or learned about Christ. It's that you learned Christ. You learned him. You know him relationally, personally. Uh, Sometimes this phrase was even used to talk about uh, renewing your warm friendship with someone, that you know them personally. Now think what Paul's already said so far about our personal relationship with Jesus in Ephesians. He said that we're seated with him in the heavenly places and that he dwells in our hearts by faith. So we have a personal connection and that personal knowing of Jesus leads us away from a disordered inner man and leads us towards the truth. The truth of what life in the Spirit and a resurrection life look like, and that leads you into the truest version of yourself. He continues on in verse 21, you heard him and you were taught in him. And these words too are meant to be relational. That Christian teaching that changes you only happens, the change only happens if you are actually in a vital relationship with the living Christ. Because it's only in Jesus that the full truth is found, and he then will reveal it to you. So here's what Paul is doing. He's saying, don't live in this former feudal way because it doesn't line up with Jesus and it doesn't line up with who he's making you to be. Reject that old identity so you can live into your new identity. You've got to reject ways that line up with self-centered living, and you've got to re-center yourself on Jesus. So he's going to give us three comments about what Jesus has taught us to do. How has Jesus taught us? If If we've learned Jesus, what is it exactly that he's teaching us to do to engage this fresh new life he has? First, in verse 22, he says to put off 
your old self. This is a clothing analogy that Paul likes to use in Colossians. Of course, you can think about having dirty, nasty, soaked, filthy clothes, maybe after working in the yard or getting stuck in the rain or after a long hike. And all you want to do is get rid and get off those old clothes. And the old clothes here, the old self, is the old identity, the former manner of life. And just like earlier in Ephesians 2, Ephesians 4 describes this former way as rebellious, spiritually aimless, and we are helpless against it. So we got to put it off. We should put it off, verse 22, because he says it's corrupt. The old self wants the wrong kinds of things, and those wrong things deceive you and lead you into ruin. And we've all experienced this. Even if we're not thinking of it spiritually, we see something that's appealing to us and we say, I want that. That looks really good and beautiful. It's shiny. That will make me feel good. That will bring meaning into my life. I want it. I need it. Whether it's I need to purchase it or I need to get to know that person, I've got to get that thing in my life. It's so appealing. And so we pursue that thing and sometimes it's fantastic. It feels really good. But even if it feels fantastic... There often is, and we don't want to admit it to ourselves, because then, well, it would tell us something true that we don't want to know. But we have to admit, if we are honest, that there's a gap between what was promised as we looked at the thing originally and what was actually delivered. And over time, we realize that there is, if we think this thing is supposed to give us more than it's giving us, we have to try harder, right? We give ourselves to it more, maybe more of it or a more extreme version of it. And what happens then is we get into this principle of diminishing returns. We're really expecting lots of results from this thing. And not only was the gap between the promise and the delivery of the goods wider than we thought to start with, as we go deeper into it, that gap continues to widen. And so we now and then are oftentimes living extremely. We're giving ourselves over to this thing in a way that actually is leading us to ruin and destruction. We think life really will be found here, and yet it's only delivering worse and worse results now, and it's going to deliver really devastating spiritual results later. Paul is saying, Christians... You don't have to be stuck in that. That's not how you were taught to live. Reject that old way of identity, that old way of thinking and desiring and living. Now, you might think from the put off metaphor, he'd immediately go to put on. That would be a fine thing to do. He does that in Colossians. But here he inserts in verse 23 something else. He says that you are to be renewed in your spirit of your minds. Now, again, you've got to see what Paul's doing here is He's saying there's a both and going on where he's talking about what's already true of you. Here's what Jesus has done and taught you. And you should continue on in these things. So the renewal here is of your inner man. When he says the spirit of your minds, there's some debate. Well, does he mean your spirit or the spirit working in you? It seems like he's talking primarily about your own inner person being renewed, but that as you are renewed, you're experiencing the comfort, encouragement, and strength of the Holy Spirit. The language is about your spirit, but as one scholar says, the Holy Spirit is hovering nearby, meaning the location of the renewal is you, but the power for renewal is from the Holy Spirit. So he's saying basically you've been renewed and you're designed for constant ongoing renewal. The third thing then finally that he teaches is Jesus teaches his people to put on the new self. Again, the same kind of grammar going on. This is already true of you. One of the reasons that we live the Christian life is because it's already been accomplished for us. Jesus has already brought us into this new life. We're already been transferred from the kingdom of dark and selfishness to the kingdom of light and humility, a life for ourselves and dependent of God versus a life with God dependent on him. That's what Jesus has already done because it's already true of us. Then Paul saying we keep living into it. Think of it a little bit like marriage. Uh, There's a decisive moment at which you get married, and yet, as you are married, you're, there's an ongoing relationship where you're loving one another, caring for one another, learning and growing together. You can't say, or you shouldn't say, well, we got married, we're still married, I married you, 
what else do you want from me, right? The fact of the past marriage actually creates the conditions of ongoing marriedness. And in the same way here, that's what Paul is talking about. Becoming a Christian is entering into a relationship, but now we're supposed to, because of the relationship that exists, we're supposed to be growing and living out what's true. So here he says you're putting on your new self, or you could say your new identity, or you could say your new humanity. And this idea of being a new self, a new human, connects us back to Genesis, where God made us in his image, but we've lost that because of our sin. Our version of being a human being isn't the actual intended version because sin has so thoroughly affected us that we aren't who we're supposed to be. And we're actually confused even about who we are and who we're supposed to be. And so the gospel tells us that our spiritual deadness, our struggle to connect with God and others and ourselves is because there's something wrong with us. We are alienated in all those different ways. Now, one answer to our alienation is to see that we're not alone in it. So I told you earlier, Sting sings about the message in the bottle. And in the song, he sends out a message in the bottle asking for help. And he waits for over a year for his SOS to be replied to. And then he says, I walked out this morning. I don't believe what I saw. A hundred billion bottles washed up on the shore. Seems I'm not alone at being alone. A hundred billion castaways looking for a home. So here in his alienation, right, he finally realizes he's not alone in being alone. The song expresses connection, solidarity. There are, everyone's alienated. Everyone's looking for a home. Now that's perceptive. But that's kind of the end of the song. It doesn't tell you how to get home. In the gospel, though, Jesus is showing us how to get home. What Jesus does is he enters into our alienation. He comes because he knows we're alienated. And he has come into that alienation to take our sin, our selfishness, our rebellion. He takes that on himself, and he experiences true alienation. The Father turns his face away from the Son, and he does it to deliver us out of our alienation and into this new life, this new full humanity where we're connected with God. We can connect truly with others because we aren't trying to get something from them inappropriately, and we can actually connect with who we are supposed to be. Again, if you think back to Ephesians 2, such an important passage where he says in 2.10, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. So when we become Christians, we are a new thing. God has recreated us. We are part of this new humanity where Jesus is the first fully human, new human person in his resurrection body. And he is bringing us with him into that fresh new life. Jesus has done the work And we are receiving the benefits, not only as we become Christians, but as we continue to think and feel and live into the new life that he has for us. Okay, as we wrap up, then I want to give you three things to consider. The first is this. This text, I said he's now made the full transition from what is true to what you do. Uh, Possibly, as we talked about this today, you still felt like, well, I don't know. Seems a little theoretical still. It's not theoretical. It's foundational instead. Meaning Paul is going to give us lots of specific things, very specific things to stop doing or to start doing or to keep doing. But here, what he's reminding us is that fundamentally for us, practically change happens from the inside out. Okay. That we have to reject the old ways and experience renewal and put on the new identity and its forms. So we have to remember, he's saying, to practically live, you've got to constantly remind yourself that Jesus has already changed these fundamental things about you, and he's calling you to live into it. So my summary application word for this is engagement. Are you engaged in word and prayer? If not, you won't grow. Are you engaged in the life of the church community? I mean, you can get by for a little while, but long term, you can't be a growing Christian without church community. Are you engaged in confessing your sin and fighting back against it? You just have to be. Are you actively loving and pursuing people to minister to them in various ways? 
Long term, you actually can't be a healthy Christian if you're not giving out as well as taking in. And finally, are you actively renewing your mind and your spirit with the Word, with books, with sermons, with music, with whatever different ways God grants to you with real conversations with other Christians? Are you seeing your mind being renewed? You will be stunted without those kinds of engagement. Okay, secondly, rejecting your old futile ways can be kind of like cleaning out the attic. You know you need to get to it, and you think, ah, I'll get to it eventually. The problem spiritually is, and if you look at this passage, right, our old desires hang on, they stick with us, they corrupt us. And so the problem is, the longer we play with sin, the harder it's going to be to get away from it. The more we say, I'll get serious about a relationship with God later, the less interested you are likely to be when later comes. And so, there's no day like today. Today is always a good day to move back towards God. So, for example, if you know that Jesus isn't the center of your life, if you're not a Christian, you're skeptical about Christianity, but you see the truth of this passage that you can't change yourself and that you actually need Jesus to do it. Today is a great day to do that. Or whoever you are, a Christian or not, if you feel like you're stuck in your sin, you're in that deceitful loop of wanting more and more and getting less and less and it's destroying you, grab somebody. Contact me. Grab a member of a women's care team. Grab an officer. Grab anyone you know who's a Christian and say, I need some help. I think I'm stuck, and I don't want to be stuck anymore. Can you help me get out of that? Because the truth is, Jesus wants to help you get unstuck, and we want to help you connect with Jesus' help. Finally, what kind of results can you expect practically? We're going to talk a lot more about this in the weeks to come. But we do want to think about this. We don't want to be naive. We don't want to be triumphalistic, where you say, well, you believe in Jesus, and everything will go really smoothly. Because that's not true. In fact, oftentimes, if you believe in Jesus, various things can get harder in your life. Now, lots of things obviously improve. Uh, Your eternal destiny, your sense of identity and peace, all these things can be true, but that doesn't mean you won't have trouble. In fact, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. You'll suffer. You will struggle. You'll have mixed motives. You'll still have to fight against sin, right? Paul says this, not because it's easy, but because it's hard, because we tend to slide back into our old ways. We sometimes, the best we can do is three steps forward and two steps back, but you can move forward. There is a a new way, a new life that God has designed for us. And notice the last phrase here in this text where he says that as you put on the new self, it's created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. True righteousness and holiness, not performance not trying to look good externally, not just self-discipline, though of course that's involved. That stuff is self-righteousness. What he's talking about here is true righteousness and holiness that's entirely connected to and flowing from what Jesus has done and is doing. So, we will become more like Jesus, he says, right? Our new self is created after the likeness of God. We become more like God in this new way of life. And I'm saying this new way of life leads to fertility versus futility. Not perfection, not performance, but change. True results of delightful kinds. Fruit in your life. New love for others that wasn't there before. The ability to have joy even sometimes in the midst of suffering. Humility when all you want to do is fight and defend yourself. Being able to truly accept God's plans for you even when they seem odd and hard to you. Paul wants us to see that Jesus speaks to us And in his speaking to our hearts, he calls us away from the former ways that lead to futility. And he offers us a fresh way that leads to spiritual fertility. Which way do you want today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that for anyone here today, we can look at this passage and we can be called by you into 
renewed, fresh, vibrant life. Father, oftentimes we miss that kind of life entirely. And so, of course, if we are not connected to you by faith, if we don't have a relationship with you, we're not able to connect. We're not able to know you. We're alienated from the life of God, you tell us. And yet, for those of us who are Christians, Paul writes this mostly to Christians because he knows that we tend to either idealize or fall back into, unfortunately, these former ways of living. And he wants to show us those are futile. That's not who you are. Don't go back to those ways, but instead come after Jesus with this new, fresh way that leads to fantastic results, to true fruit. So, Father, we pray that you would deeply convince our hearts of this, that wherever exactly we are spiritually today, that you'd help us to um, understand this deeply, to love it, to know it, and to respond to you. Father, we thank you that you're at work, that even today as we hear your word, you are at work to bring new life into our lives. Help us by your spirit to respond in faith and trust. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this passage gives us great news that Jesus transfers us out of this former and futile way of life into a fresh and fertile life with him. So therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Inwardly, Jesus renews us day by day. Amen. Amen.